Yeah. This meeting is being recorded. John's magic checklist for high flex. What am I supposed to do? Hey, Michelle. We have a lot to cover today, so there may be a couple more people trickling in, but I want to get started. We are recording the session, so in case there's anybody who missed it or wants to catch up or listen to it again, hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Bonnie Ripley. I am a faculty member in the biology department, and um, I've been department chair for the last couple years. And before that, I did a lot of uh, other things around the college. I helped write accreditation self-studies. I was on the program review committee for years and years and years. And I thought that stepping into the role of a department chair was going to be easy after having done all those things. And I discovered to my shock and horror that it was an entirely different set of things that I needed to know and know how to do, and that there was a really steep learning curve, and that there wasn't any training, and we were all just kind of flapping our arms around and, and desperately trying to do all the things that were landing in our email, you know, our dean would email me something and I'd be like, I have to do that this week? Ah! So, um, so there's been a lot of, of conversations in the chairs and coordinators meeting about, um, couldn't we please, please have some chairs training? And so um, since I was elected um, the chair of the council, of chairs and coordinators. <laughs> I've taken that on as my, my big project that I'm going to be working on. And because that role on campus touches so many people, um, that what I've done for this presentation today is to make a collaboration between lots of different people from around the college. Because in order for us to be able to do our job as chairs and coordinators, there's a lot of other people who depend on us doing our job well for them to do their job. And it's a very interlinked synergistic system. Um, and so I would like first to thank all of the collaborators who are um, going to help with this presentation today. It isn't going to just be me talking all the time. And um, that the presentation that we have today is basically the outline of a chairs and coordinators training that's going to be developed. So sort of we're just trying to touch on topics and help maybe get people thinking about taking on the role of chair and coordinator if they've never thought about it before. Maybe folks around campus don't really know what a chair does. You might feel afraid of taking on that job because you aren't, aren't sure what it entails. Um, and so that is uh, part of the, the purpose of the um, workshop. I mean, I have something else in my notes here. All right. So hopefully after um, the presentation today, you'll feel a lot more like, you know, leadership on campus doesn't have to be a person with certain knowledge or experience already. It doesn't have to be a person who looks a certain way or has a certain characteristics and that the college is a better place when we have people from more diverse backgrounds and experiences who are taking on um, leadership roles. All right, so All right, <laughs> sorry about this. Uh, we threw this all together uh, a little bit last minute. I apologize to my co presenters. So for a little disorganized um, I just uh, appreciate your patience and um, it looks like Augustine is, is ready and waiting to 
transition to the next slide, which he has agreed to help me um, uh, present. So please take it away, Dean Alberon. Well, thank you, Bonnie. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all here uh, in Zoom and over there in the HyFlex room. I know that some other folks are, are gathered as well. Uh, I chose to just stay here because I've been running around doing presentations and trying to knock off some uh, other responsibilities. But thank you, Bonnie, and all for this opportunity. You know, I wanted to share that my first exposure to anything to do with uh, chairs or coordinators was 16 years ago when I came to this campus, uh, the very first meeting, the very first meeting that I ever went to was a chairs and coordinators meeting that I was invited to come to to speak about uh, students' rights and responsibilities and student discipline. At the time, I was the Dean of Student Affairs. So that was my first exposure. And much like, uh, you know, some of the chairs and program coordinators and others, I had no training. Uh, I was just given the little green discipline booklet and said, uh, here it is, go do it. So that was my first exposure. So this is, you know, comes out of necessity, right? Um, we, we need to think about roles where people can step in and it's not defined by a person, but by uh, job responsibilities, job outcomes, uh, and what the job entails. So, so thank you, Bonnie, for asking me to, to participate. And I just want to share a, a couple of points. Um, today, you're going to hear about the role of the department chair and the program coordinator. You are also going to hear about uh, some of the very tasks and responsibilities of the program chair or the program coordinator. You're going to hear from a, a variety of folks, uh, some administrative assistants, uh, folks in the CTE program, uh, you're going to hear about some uh, responsibilities such as curriculum updates and submissions, counseling, uh, CPI, such as annual unit plans and uh, faculty staffing application and presentation processes, the library, SLO folks. And then you're also going to hear a little bit about what uh, program coordinators do with regards to hiring, uh, schedule, production, line sheets. And then you'll even um, learn a little bit about the difference between uh, participatory governance and sort of the operational processes that uh, a chair or a program coordinator is involved with. So that's a, a bit of an overview, but the goal here is to explain to you and to demonstrate what some of those major roles and major tasks are that chairs and coordinators do. And as Bonnie had said, so that folks feel empowered to perhaps take on the role and learn more about what it is um, that entails this type of job responsibility. And um, you, as I had just indicated, you're going to um, learn from other folks, different areas around campus, what some of those duties are so that you have better understanding at the interplay between the divisions. And then lastly, uh, you'll hear some advice from um, folks on being a chair, being a coordinator, and, um, you know, maybe had I known this, you know, then, have I known now what I knew then, that kind of thing, we can also uh, do that way. So uh, next slide, please, Bonnie. Uh, yep. Okay. So what is the role of a uh, chair and a coordinator? What does the department chair and coordinator do? And if you're thinking, you know, philosophically, uh, well, the, the chair and the coordinator is sort of that, that calm, reasoned uh, individual, that wise, well-informed leader. Uh, really, it's, it's uh, sort of the, the leadership of a division or a, a program. Uh, and it's really the, the individual who is the conduit also between uh, upper administration uh, and, and, you know, between the part-time faculty and the full-time faculty and where uh, one's contributions and actions produce the work of a given uh, program or department. So it's really that, that conduit piece. And as, as Bonnie opened uh, when she mentioned, collaboration is key. It's all about collaboration and the other C word, communication. So those are hugely important, uh, philosophically speaking. And then on a practical lens, again, it's that conduit, that connective piece. Uh, you know, if we were talking biology, uh, it would be that connective tissue, right? Uh, if we were talking uh, mathematics, it's almost like a formula, one relationship to another, uh, and, and so on. 
Uh, often the most influential person in the life of a full-time or part-time faculty member is the department chair or the program coordinator because that is the individual that folks are going to for information, for resources, uh, for technology requests, and for those things that help shape a department. Um, the inverse is also true. Uh, deans rely heavily uh, on the department chair or the coordinator to shape uh, their respective department, right? And their um, specialty areas. Uh, for example, Allied Health and Nursing has accreditation requirements that are different to, to maintain their programs, such as respiratory therapy, uh, cardiovascular um, uh, technology, and, and nursing, just to name a few. Uh, CTE and workforce development uh, have radically different areas, such as culinary arts, administration of justice, child development, and the very exciting and new uh, drone program. And then, you know, we can't forget the library and, and counseling either. They each have very unique requirements. Uh, library, maybe it's talking about acquisitions uh, for the library and holdings or certain uh, types of materials uh, to be uh, acquired. So um, counseling as well and the ESBS division, which I, I get the pleasure of serving, also have unique uh, needs, uh, 11 different departments and uh, 10 departments, one program in the ESPS division. So um, again, a little bit later, we'll get into some advice from the Dreenery, what we all wish we knew as chairs and coordinators uh, to help us in our roles and our responsibilities and uh, what we wish we knew previously to help us in our roles and responsibilities. And that's it for that slide, Bonnie. All right, thanks, um, Augustine. So as I was thinking about, you know, what advice I might like to give a, about being a chair and how the cha chairs and the, and the deans work together on campus, I was thinking about, you know, what movies I'd watched over the summer and what different characters there were that we might think of when we're thinking about, you know, who's a character that would be playing a dean or a department coordinator. Um, and we may have different leadership styles that people show across the spectrum from being somebody who really maybe is trying to um, consolidate power in their department or even for themselves personally, um, all the way to a person who is, you know, like Yoda basically is, you know, she never answers a question with, with anything but another question. So. Nobody on this campus is as you know, evil as Kylo Ren or as wise <laughs> as Yoda. Um, but hopefully as we are moving forward, going in the direction that we talked about, the college um, was heading towards, uh, we're steering ourselves towards in convocation this morning, that we wanna find some place in the middle where instead of departments fighting with one another, like at some Game of Thrones where there's winners and losers and everybody's trying to accumulate as much resource as they can, that we all have a good understanding of where the college is at, what the institutional goals are, how our department fits into that, um, uh, what position our department takes when we look at that bigger picture, um, what direction our discipline is going, what are the things that we need right now, and our deans are really there to help us get those things. And so as I've been um, a chair working with my dean, Sean Hicks, who's here with us today in person, that uh, collaborating with your dean is the easiest way <laughs> to get the things um, that you need. And even though we may have had some um, administration and managers on this college in the past that we had a, a harder time working with, um, I'm really happy with the leadership team we have um, on campus right now. And I've been really impressed with how passionate our deans are about trying to help their departments and their divisions do the best that they can. Um, so sort of philosophically, I would like us to see the whole college moving in a direction where chairs and coordinators are facilitating department decision-making, supporting their colleagues so that we can all do the very best jobs that we would like to, um, facilitating learning for our students um, and also fulfilling the 
uh, strategic goals of the college. So as we are thinking about what we do as a department chair, I just wanted to, to plant this seed of cooperation and collaboration rather than um, competition. In ecology, which is the discipline that's my specialty, we look at how different organisms can interact with one another in the environment. And you may have seen lots of examples of um, like a clownfish and the anemone that it lives in. We all love those examples. And those are mutualisms. Those are relationships between different species where both species benefit, all right? And we can think of that as a, as a plus plus relationship. Predator prey is a plus for the predator and a minus for the prey, right? Competition is a minus for both interactors. And if you think about it in business as well, when we have two companies competing with one another, they both are losing customers to the other company. And what do they want to do? Try and make a monopoly, right? Instead of having any competition. So when we're, we're competing with one another, both sides lose, right? And when I think about how the college works, um, and we often talk about, oh, my department needs this, you know, yes, you have good reasons for needing those things in your own department. But after sitting on program review for seven years and seeing all the departments come through, every single department is doing amazing things. They're doing really cool stuff and they're serving students and they're being innovative and they have fabulous programs. And if you just look at them by themselves, absolutely, they need whatever resources they're asking for. The problem is when we take a step back and we have a finite amount of resources, how do we prioritize who gets it? And so being able to take a little bit of a step back from just your own department perspective is really, really helpful. And program review is amazing for getting to learn more about all the other areas on campus and all the neat stuff that they're, um, that they're doing. And this can extend also to our sister college, Cuyamaca. I know we like to think, well, you know, they're over there stealing our students or whatever. But what if we cooperated with them? What if we collaborated and so that we could balance between the two colleges, how many sections of each classes we're teaching, right? So my philosophy about how to be a chair, how to be a faculty leader on campus is to try and find a win-win scenario for, for all the players, right? So, and I encourage everybody to try and come to your department leadership roles um, from that perspective as well. All right, so as we're thinking about what a chair does, um, it's really important to understand um, where chairs and coordinators fit in to how the college runs. The college has a very complicated and difficult to implement well uh, organizational structure. There's two sides to the, um, how the college is run. And if we look on the left-hand side, of this diagram. This is what we call the participatory governance. And we have um, all of these different uh, councils and committees, um, facilities, budget, technology, staffing, and all of the constituent groups on campus, um, which are called out in the legislation that set up the community college system. We're required by law to have these four constituent groups consult on this whole range of topics. The four constituent groups are the faculty, the classified staff, the administrators association, and the students intended to have equal input on these matters. And these matters are things that have to do with prioritization of resources and kind of overall big picture directions that the college is going. Right. How are we going to, if we need to change something, if we need to make decisions, hard decisions about how we're going to allocate resources, we want to have consultation among all these different stakeholders on campus. So as faculty, we participate in that process by being academic senate reps, and then those academic senate um, representatives sit on those committees and bring the faculty voice into those conversations. Right now, we don't have the best communication yet between our participatory governance committee 
Senate reps and bringing that information back to the Senate so that we can have good discussions about it. Everybody knows what's going on, et cetera. Right? That's a work in progress. <laughs> um, so that's really different than the role of um, department chairs. So we're all the way over here on the other side. So we have basically decisions um, about the direction the college is going are gonna be made on the left-hand side here. But then when it's time to implement those decisions, then the instructions for, okay, this is what the decision was. How are we going to implement it? What do we need to do? What resource, you know, so that's going to go from the president to the vice president and then uh, vice president of academic affairs for us and then to all the deans and then from the deans to the chairs and coordinators. So we have information flow of we need to implement something right in a beautifully functioning campus we would have choice in the way that we implemented those things right there was some decision made y'all sort out how you're going to make it happen right that would be lovely and in many cases it does happen right? um the other thing is that information flows the other direction from faculty and staff in our academic departments to the chairs to the deans hey this thing is going on in our department we need help with this Right. Um, and then this council of chairs and coordinators is kind of hanging off to the side like some kind of tumor. Um, <laughs> and it's really a way of sort of short circuit, like 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 condensing some of the steps in this process. So if there is somebody who wants to talk to all the chairs and coordinators right, to get information to us that we can get to our faculty, they can come to a chairs and coordinators meeting. They don't have to go to every single different department meeting or, or every single different division council meeting. All right. Um, and it's also a way that um, if there's similar issues that are affecting different departments around campus, sometimes even in different divisions from one another, that's the place where the chairs and coordinators can talk about it and say, hey, this isn't only going on in my department. This is an issue that's more, more campus wide. So, we sort of have, you know, a set of, 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 of governance processes that kind of go this way. And you can almost think of the other ones like they're, they're, they're cross cutting, like they're going the other direction. Right now, as faculty, we also have um, things going on on campus that actually relate to our, our contract with the union. Now, AFT isn't on this diagram because those things are, are separate. Um, and that one of the things that we struggle with and we will continue to struggle with because it's hard is figuring out what is the thing we're talking about it is it appropriate for this thing to be dealt with in the operational perspective like do we need more speakers <laughs> um is this a participatory governance issue that needs to have input from students faculty staff and administrators Right? Or is this a working conditions thing that we need to take to the AFT for them to negotiate with the college? Right? So it can be really hard to figure out where the right place to have those conversations are. And that's something that Pro Lopez and I have talked about, our academic senate president. <laughs> are we talking about this thing in the right place? Right. Um, does anybody have any questions about that while I peer at my notes? All right, so the other thing that we can think about the role of department leaders, it doesn't necessarily have to be department chairs, is that we have some things that we do that are really just day to day, like getting the schedule up and, you know, little tasks that simply just have to be done by somebody. And we designate that department chair or coordinator, the kind of the buck stops there. There's somebody who's responsible for, you know, turning in these forms, somebody that everybody knows they can go to. So it's kind of like a telephone tree. Right, that we have that one person that kind of just is responsible for making sure that stuff happens. It can also be true, and it's also great, if that person is thinking not just about management, which is sort of how we do stuff, but leadership. What direction do we need to go in from where we are? Right? Do we need to turn into a different direction from where we are? So when I think about leadership, that's more like, 
you know, uh, what things are going on in the outside world that we need to respond to. Um, how can we continuously improve? How can we do a better job? It doesn't have to be a department chair that can participate in, in, in leading the direction um, of the department, but it's often a role that, um, that uh, department chairs may take on. All right. So when people um, think about becoming department chair, the first thing that they usually say to me is, I don't want to be a chair because I hate going to meetings. <laughs> Um, so there's there's a relatively modest number of meetings that you'll require to go to academic senate at our college all department chairs are also um, academic senators so we we are sort of plugged into that role that isn't true at all colleges. Um, there is this Council of chairs and coordinators meeting those are all on Mondays from 11 to 1220 so that's kind of a slot that sort of. Um, faculty leadership stuff has been slotted into. Now, if you're thinking about becoming a chair and you already teach a class in that time, then it might take a couple semesters for you to, you know, jiggle your schedule around to make sure that you're going to be able to have that time available to take on, um, to, to go <laughs> to those meetings. Um, each division has a division council meeting, and that's with the dean and then all the chairs that are in that division. That's different than the flex week division meeting, which is all the faculty, all the, right? So there's division meeting at, at flex week division council meetings. Um, and then the department chairs are going to schedule, set the agendas for and run um, the department meetings. And the different departments have different cultures as to how frequently they meet. I think there's some departments on campus that meet every week. Um, my department, we meet, we meet once a month, one month. So I don't, there aren't um, requirements for that. I strongly encourage people who are in department leadership roles to participate in um, SLO workshops. It's great to just get that training and know what is going on with, with SLO stuff. Um, personally, I go to all of the district and college planning forums, workshops, information <laughs> sessions, professional development events. Um, and I feel like the more I know about what's going on in the district and the college and all these different initiatives and the strategic plans and whatever, the better job I can do of piloting my department through all of those, those different things. Um, you can also delegate somebody from your department who might be interested in those things and have them report back. Um, and then AFT. Um, you want to keep an eye on what's going on with AFT. For example, um, we just got the brand new high flex um, side letter. And, you know, as a chair, I need to be able to let my faculty know if they're teaching high flex, how much they're going to get paid, what are the things, you know, so, um, so staying tuned to AFT is also helpful. Right. So in order for us to be able to do the work of being a chair, which is time consuming, we get reassigned from teaching to doing chair duties. This idea of reassigned time is time that we, um, it's, it's part of our, our LED, right? We have to have 1.0 of load each semester as a full-time faculty to get paid. Um, and so we're gonna trade some teaching time out of that to, for, for chairing stuff. The amount depends on the size of the department. Um, there's some amount of work that I think every chair across campus has to do no matter what, how big their department is. But then on top of that, if you have a schedule that has 20 sections of class on it, it isn't going to take you as long to go through all those edits and, and, um, and build that schedule as if you have 200 sections that you're teaching in your department. Right? If you have five adjunct faculty to hire in a semester, that's a certain amount of work hiring 15 adjunct faculty in one semester is more work. So there's historically, there was a, a little calculation formula for how much reassigned time different departments would get. And it was based on course that, and it was this mathematical calculation. Um, uh, that's been thrown out. It hasn't been replaced by anything else. Um, 
and it is in our, our union contract. So we have pretty high levels of reassigned time for our different departments, um, but it's never enough. <laughs> it's never enough. Um, and then we are re required to, or we need to be available somewhat more than a normal faculty would be. Um, sometimes an emergency comes up, something with a student, something with an instructor. Sometimes you might get a phone call in the evening or on a weekend. Over the summer, the business of the college proceeds. Um, and so we have some pay for uh, working hours over the summer to take into account that being on duty <laughs> is, um, is compensated. All right, so you might be getting really tired of listening to me talk and you said, oh, this is a collaborative workshop among all these people and yet you're standing up there and blah, blah, blah. Um, we're almost to the end of the stuff that I'm talking about. Let's see. Nope, we've got some chat going on. <sighs> yes, we have a chat about um, turnover in deans. Yeah, that is tough. That is tough. We want to build a relationship with our dean, and um, we depend on them to know stuff. Um, and we're getting a new dean, or we have interim deans, or whatever. Um, that is a, a problem. I don't think it's unique to Grossmont. Um, but we can overcome these kinds of challenges and try and, uh, you know, be on a hiring committee for a dean that is, is coming up and try and, you know, we want to try and hire a dean that's going to be a really excellent person who's a good fit for our, um, for our school. And then we also want to help retain our deans. And we as department faculty can have some, um, role in that if we're all jerks to our deans they aren't going to want to stay <laughs> if we're willing to collaborate with them and help them do a good job um then i would say i'm not speaking for the deans here but i can probably tell you they're much happier you know if if we're trying to cooperate and collaborate um their job is not easy the more the more i i um uh, interact with with the different deans, um, the less I would ever want to take on that job myself. They're just sort of, they're on call 24 seven, they have to deal with everything. Um, the administration tells them one thing, the faculty want to do something else. They're stuck in the middle trying to figure out how to make it work. Um, so, so I admire that, um, that, that skill in people. Um, okay. In the biology department, we're a pretty big department. I feel like I spent 80% of my chair time working on our schedule. So I wanted to talk about the schedule. The actual schedule, um, I'm gonna unshare. When I say the schedule, wait, what happened? When I say the schedule, I mean, what we see, uh, what classes are offered, what days and times, what modality, uh, who's teaching them, what, um, basically all the information that's going to go into our online um, course catalog, right? That's, I need to reshare my screen. Thank you. Uh, Zoomers, are you seeing the um, biology schedule? Yes. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we have the um, course, this is for fall. We can see that um, how our classes are filling up in our schedule. This is the way that we as department chairs and deans are gonna say, well, do we need to cancel sections? Do we need to add sections as those students are, are registering and we can see in real time. So if you as a faculty member have never been invited to look at your department's whole schedule, how many sections do we have of different courses? Who's teaching what? When are they offered? What days and times? 
um, this is available for anyone and everyone to look at and kind of see what's going on in the department. I have some faculty who tell me, oh, I didn't know we could do that. You know, are we allowed to do that? Of course you are. Um, so all the information that's in this schedule is put together in a certain format that gets typed into some software by our instructional operations folks. So when we say um, making edits to the line sheets, the line sheets are basically a big printout of what our last semester was like. Right? So if we're working on the fall schedule, we'll get our last fall schedule. If we're working on the spring schedule, we'll get our last spring schedule. And then we say, OK, what changes do we want to make? Um, and then you know you start doing the edits. So when we're looking at those line sheets, Sorry. And I'm going to share. This is my very first time ever teaching in High Flex, and I didn't even finish all my training. So, you know, <laughs> I think I'm doing okay. Um, so we have a lot of information, um, but mostly department chairs are going to be filling in the instructor who's going to be teaching that course, um, the, the days and times, whether it's online or in person, the deans are going to be assigning classrooms. Um, and then based on the schedule of the course, how many units it is, how many hours it needs, that's going to determine our LED, our load equivalent decimal. decimal, right? How much you're going to get paid for teaching that class? You know, point two is standard for a three-unit lecture course. Um, so you know, there's a bunch of stuff in here. I don't even know what all of this stuff is. Um, your when we say edit the line sheets, that's literally all it is, right? Now. Sean wanted to make a point about line sheet stuff, so I'll let you take over. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Uh, Javier, uh, I've jumped over to this part because I wanted to talk about scheduling and uh, just some things that I'll tell you a little bit about my story, kind of moving from department chair into the dean role. Uh, the first question I asked the department chairs that I was taking over for. Uh, who was uh, Nemi Kapasi and, and Shirley Pereira, I asked them, what's easier? Is it easier to add courses or delete them? And they said, oh, it's definitely easier to delete them because as a chair, you're just like looking down the list and seeing what's really low enrolled and saying, oh, got to delete that. So that feels easy on the faculty or the chair side. But that what that's it's not easy. And then moving forward, stepping into the dean role, what I realized working with instructional operations is that's a very difficult thing for them to do. We have students who are in those courses. So that's the first thing I have to think about. There may not be many because they're low enrolled, but there are students in those courses that are going to be displaced. Uh, there's also instructional operations, which has a five step process for canceling those classes. So one thing that I'm realizing is the workload that's going around the campus and the impact that's having on everyone involved. Uh, so one of the goals uh, for our campus in scheduling is to try and look for that, that sweet spot of about 80%. We're looking for a targeting that 80% fill rate. That's a very difficult thing to do, especially in these times where things are changing so much. Uh, but if we think about an 80% fill rate, the first thing we wanna think about is how many sections for a course should we be scheduling? So we're taking a look at historic data, we're taking a look at success rates for the previous semester and thinking about all right, for a particular course, how many sections do I need in order to capture 80% of those students across those sections? The next thing we want to think about after that is where should those students or where should those courses, where should those sections be scheduled throughout the day? A lot of people want to schedule everything right there between nine to two, because that's when the majority of our students are on campus. Um, but there are students that need to be here in the evening. There are students that need to be here early in the morning for those that work. So we're trying to keep all of those things in mind as well as we think about the scheduling process. Um, uh, 
excuse me for my senior moment here, just a moment. Um, that, uh, You're doing great, Sean. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Javier. Thank you. Uh, so the idea that- Keep uh, going, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, oh, I guess the, the other thing is, is that this scheduling process is really a collaboration between the deans and the department chairs. And when that collaboration happens early and we are communicating back and forth, keeping an eye on uh, enrollments as they're kind of rising and, or as they're rising towards the semester and really coming up with plans, what are we going to do if? And kind of coming up with those plans really makes um, executing plans and minimizing the impact to everyone on campus a lot easier. And so when I have those, uh, those proactive conversations with the department chairs, it makes everything run so much smoother. And uh, the, the, the flip side to that is if I have to go back last week or this week and, 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 and make decisions based on numbers without having conversations yet, that's very difficult to do. And what always happens there is, is any of those decisions become, you know, fodder for you know fire and you know why are you doing this well I, I i need to have conversations in order to make informed decisions and and so just working together is the best thing and we're all working together to provide the best experience for our students and, and i think that we can all agree on that and uh, and that's been my goal as a dean is just to to try and support each one of the departments in making these decisions to have the least impact and have the best support for our students so that's just a few things i wanted to say about scheduling are there any questions or online? Yeah, I have, I have a question. Hey, Sean, great job, by the way. I just wanted to add that also um, we receive uh, full time um, equivalent faculty uh, allotment that the state through the district down to the vice president then to us. And it's important to also look at that in a very transparent fashion. Uh, from chair to chair to chair with the dean in a given division so that uh, there isn't any feeling that, oh, the dean is giving more resources to this area or, you know, this, this area always gets uh, more classes, et cetera. And as, uh, you know, Bonnie has started to say about the schedule making, I mean, there's science, there's art, but it really is data driven. And that's where the, um, the uh, allotment that we receive from the vice president is converted into a uh, department share. And if there is some leftover of that full-time equivalent faculty uh, number, it can be shared from department to department, program to program, and even division to division. And it, it is very hard work uh, as uh, Javier and both Sean know, this is what we live and breathe. Uh, the reason I've had my camera off in between discussion is because I'm looking at enrollment constantly. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just wanted to add that contribution as well. Right, and not to not to hijack your presentation ahead, much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Upon just really quickly, yeah, I think uh, you know there's there's a there's a stepwise process that's used for for setting the schedule. You know, as Augustine and um, Sean had mentioned. We try to be as deliberate as possible, but not to the point where that constrains people's um, creativity and innovation. Because if we always did what we did the last semester, you know, we can plan for the future, right? So, uh, you know, from having classes that are needed for graduation to having a less <clears throat> volume of classes in certain sections, all those. Uh, I guess algorithm is going to play when it comes to setting up the schedule. It's not solely, uh, it, it's it's science, it's part craft, it's part like flexibility. A big part is flexibility. You think you have a schedule and then all of a sudden nobody shows up, you gotta be able to pivot and reshift. Or you think you have a schedule, now you have demand and wait lists that are busting at the seams, so you gotta pivot and shift. Or, um, you know, you have a, a faculty who decides to bail last minute because they got a full-time job, you got to shift and pivot again. You know, um, so one thing that the deans learn how to do is shift and pivot. So, and we, you know, we but, but we need to be able to do that effectively. We need that uh, partnership and communication with our uh, chairs and coordinators. 
Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, I would say one of the things that I wish I had known earlier as a department chair was how much further ahead of time I should be planning for everything than I, especially the first semester, <laughs> I actually did. Um, and so if you have, you know, you don't need any part-time faculty right now, but maybe you should look in the adjunct pool and start interviewing people so that if something does come up at the last minute that you've already screened some folks and you have an idea about what, um, uh, who you might have available. Diana? Uh, Bonnie, that's a really good point with the adjunct hiring because now with the creation of the work groups, yeah, you're, I mean, I have had a heck of a time trying to find somebody uh, before in June for, for this semester, just getting the work groups together almost almost didn't happen. And I heard from my colleagues at CMACA that they couldn't get an EEO representative to be in their work group, so they just went along with the regular procedure. But that's definitely going to be a a hurdle for chairs hiring. It was for chemistry. Yeah, we couldn't get an EEO over the summer either. So we've ended up, you know, having to hire without it. Since the procedures are new, um, there aren't that many people trained as EEOs yet. Hopefully that will get easier and easier and we'll 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 be able to staff those task forces much more readily as we roll along um, with the with the process. So yeah. Um, so one one last thought on on scheduling and our role as department chairs and coordinators and working together with the deans. We have, um, I think, historically at colleges, we might have had a very hierarchical structure for how we assign and, and staff sections. You know, the most senior full time faculty get to say what classes they want to teach and what days and times they want to teach them. And then there's kind of this pecking order of who, who gets to pick classes next. And then, you know, the newest person just gets stuck on whatever is left over and they don't have much choice. And then we assign our, our adjunct um, kind of, you know, we offer them something and they can take it or leave it. Um, I've been experimenting with <laughs> um, in the last couple of semesters, trying to figure out where our limiting resources are first. Um, what are the, the, the adjuncts that are the hardest to find and that have con conflicts in their schedules? Schedule those people in first, and then I have some very, very gracious full-time faculty like Michelle Perchez, who's here today, who is willing to set her schedule to fill in the gaps in, in the sections that we, are, we can't staff with this, our, our scarce resource, our qualified adjuncts for that. Um, I've also been able to move some part-time folks' schedules around so that they can maintain their, their load and not lose their health benefits. Um, maybe their other work schedules changed and they you know, need to teach online or they need to move a class from a Thursday to a Friday. Well, we can do that, we can move it, right? As long as it's still meeting the needs of our students. Um, so I wanna reiterate the point Sean made about we need to set a schedule that's the classes the students need and the days and times that they want to be in those classes, things that are gonna work for our students, and then figure out a way to staff those sections. Um, and so we may uh, wanna sort of set the schedule first and then work on filling in faculty rather than just letting faculty say, oh, I wanna do this, this, and this. Um, and so that's been a tough transition. I think we're starting to do it. And, um, you know, where people have been teaching a certain way, a certain day and time and room for a long time, and all of a sudden they're told, you can't teach in that room anymore. And they're like, ah, what do you mean? <laughs> it's my room. Um, maybe there's another class that is better to go into that room at that time. And so there's been a lot of work that's gone into trying to think about how all of the pieces and parts of the puzzle fit together and the way that we can um, serve the most students, um, get them the things they need, and also get our, you know, our, our faculty schedule. All right. Um, I think I'm ready to turn it back over to you, Augustine. Our next topic. Okay. We have, thank you, Bonnie. Um, and thank you, Sean, Javier, everybody. Uh, department chair, coordinator tasks, uh, personnel and hiring. 
Um, yeah, as, as Bonnie had indicated, you know, the work does um, frequently spill over into the summer, but there are summer chair hours. So there is compensation. And as, as deans, uh, we do try to be very sensitive to not, um, you know, call outside of those hours or, you know, folks travel, uh, folks have lives, and we really do our best to try and honor that. Um, the inverse, um, is, is somewhat uh, untrue in that uh, my department chairs have me on, on speed dial and it is a, a 724 uh, responsibility uh, or you know, you're getting calls on the weekend as a dean, et cetera. But that is what I am in service to. I am in service to my chairs and my faculty and certainly to the students that, um, that pay me. Uh, they're the ones that, that put uh, their stamp on my paycheck. That's who I work for. But in order to do the work that we do, it has to be in unison with the department chairs and program coordinators. Um, you know, uh, you, previously you also saw uh, Sean Hicks who came from faculty to chair to dean. So it's also a career path and it is a rewarding career path. Although this is a very difficult job, I'd say to a person we love this job. I, I do. I, I live it and I breathe it. I love it. Uh, no two days are alike. I could almost guarantee you that Dr. Ayala would say the same and that Sean Hicks would say the same as well. It's very rewarding work, as difficult as it is. Um, it is classic middle management, though, right? Uh, you know, being squeezed from, from all angles because we are not only beholden to uh, the faculty, but also to uh, upper administration and certainly to students. So it does come in from all angles, but again, the pivot points and the, um, that Dr. Ayala spoke about, very, very crucial. And those are things that cannot be done without uh, a department chair or coordinator. Some of the things that uh, department chairs and coordinators do, some of the tasks are to submit um, full-time hiring requests uh, with annual unit plans and to work with their um, deans and amongst uh, the rest of the department uh, to present to the faculty staffing committee and that is done in the fall. Uh, also to serve as a chair of a hiring committee and to co-chair a hiring committee for a full-time faculty member with the division dean and also for uh, full-time and classified uh, hires and uh, also to serve on tenure review committees so these are things that happen in conjunction now with the new EEO process that uh, Bonnie was mentioning as well. Uh, we hire for our adjunct faculty with the EEO. And uh, I have found uh, that it has been very effective. In, in this division, we hired 11 people, uh, some for CCAP for the high school and some here for our college. Um, so there's the screening process that uh, was mentioned here as well that can be done in Workday. That is something that a uh, uh, department chair or program coordinator would do uh, and interview, set up those interviews uh, and collaborate with the deans to set up uh, new uh, courses with the faculty to submit to uh, curriculum and to, to develop those new courses. Also to be mindful of student learning outcomes, uh, to provide orientation and training. And I just have to applaud uh, this effort I have to applaud Bonnie for doing this because this is really where it starts. This is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, the training and the mentoring of new hires and in particular chairs to have that confidence to say, hey, this is something that I'm interested in, that I, I really want to do. And now, you know, I see that it's been done. Uh, other people have done it. And I have a group of people that can support me and assist me in this process. And also to... Um, work as uh, um, peer reviewers of assignments if needed and to coordinate assignments uh, on, uh, for faculty as well. So it's, it's a very rewarding job. There's a lot of tasks, there's a lot of minutia, a lot of meetings, but they're not frightening. Uh, there are things that uh, once you get a few under your belt, they are, they are doable. And there are people here in this room and throughout the college that would assist one in that process. You can 
count me as one of those individuals, and I'm sure that uh, my peer deans of the room would say the same as well. So that in a nutshell is some of the uh, department chair responsibilities. I know that uh, time is, is of the essence here. So I'll move on or allow someone else to chime in or to see if there are any questions or, I don't know, Bonnie, do you wanna wait for questions at the end or as they come up? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll wait. I mean, if somebody has a, people are putting questions in the chat. Um, Let's see, oh yeah. We're seven. actually on schedule as far as time okay. goes. <laughs> it's a miracle. Um, it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that, um, you know, just, just from, from my perspective, faculty hiring is, um, it can be a really sensitive area in your department and that the more and um, the more thoughtful, the more time you can set aside for thoughtful conversations with all the faculty in your department, the more time you can spend crafting the, you know, the job interview questions, the, the easier it's going to be to find the perfect person for, for your department. So we have a tremendous amount of new resources and training available. Um, Tanisha Helen has um, been instrumental in, in doing that work. So I invited her to come in, in, in be one of the presenters today, but she wasn't available. Um, so there's, you know, um, there's always room for improvement in our, in our processes and it. Unfortunately, most of the things that we would like to do, they take time. And that's what we may not have, right? So um, we may not have time for those thoughtful conversations in our, in our department. So, um, but uh, just recognizing that it would be great if we did is a good place to start. Okay, let's see who is up next. Okay, um, Dia Seves is visiting us to talk about um, curriculum and she asked to share her screen. So I'm gonna give her control. Go ahead, Dee. Uh, thanks, you can keep that back up. I just wanted to click over to the website when we got to this point. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> or you can do that too once we get there. Oh, okay, yeah, I can click. Okay. I have do a you <laughs> Do you want to put the oh, slide back? It oh, Sorry. It's okay. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Whatever you like. That was a that was a high flex glitch. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see you all here. I feel like um, I've had the opportunity to work with the majority of you on your curriculum and on your chair duties related to that uh, for your department. So it's been a lot of fun getting to work with you all. Um, I know things are sometimes um, a challenge, but we've managed to figure out uh, really good ways to move forward um, through the pandemic and, and now moving forward. So lots of changes in curriculum in the last few years, um, especially since the retirement of um, the one and only Marsha Rayburn. Um, so anyhow, in terms of curriculum, I just wanted to touch on it briefly because there is um, so much content um, that we could go into here, but I do invite you to um, schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me or your division excuse me, your division rep to kind of go into more detail about curriculum uh, if you're interested in learning. I also have a co-chair this year, Sebastian Cromier. I don't know if he's here, um, but he will also be um, learning um, and he has been on the curriculum committee for as long as I have. So um, feel free to uh, tap him on the shoulder as well. So Assembly Bill uh, 1725 gives faculty purview over curriculum. So at Grossmont College, we take this uh, very seriously and um, faculty, it's a faculty driven process. Uh, we have an academic Senate committee and as Bonnie um, showed, um, we have representatives from each of the divisions who sit on this committee, but is, it's also an, in, an inclusive committee that includes um, staff of the college. It also includes um, student services administration and also instructional administration. Um, so it's a really good representative group. We have a fantastic group of individuals who've been serving for a very long time, many of whom are in here. Um, and so 
we'll get to that part. Um, but just the reminder is that uh, curriculum is a yearly process uh, that we ask chairs to review. We publish a, um, a list of all of our existing curriculum with the board approval dates, and we ask for those reviews so that you can keep them updated. Our requirement for ACCJC and Title V is that they're updated on cycle every six years, um, and that moves through the curriculum process in about one year. So really you're looking at five years if you want to be um, ahead of the deadline. So it's important to kind of look at that every year and see how many courses you have. You can chunk them out or you can work really hard <laughs> and get a lot of them done at once. Departments, uh, depending on size and, um, you know, their familiarity with the forms, um, have chosen both routes. Um, but we're working at Grossman College to uh, get our course outlines out of date and reduce the amount of course outlines that are older than 15 years. So uh, that is our goal. We do have a course revision policy. Um, so a lot of progress has been made in this area. One of the other items of curriculum that comes up for chairs is prerequisite clearances. So part of your curriculum process is to uh, review your requisites. So if you have a prerequisite, a co-requisite, or an advisory, we ask you to review that every six years to ensure that that is still relevant and necessary for student success in your course. We ask that you do that through uh, content review. Um, and so that's an opportunity for you to think about whether this is working for you or not working for you, not working for students. Um, so there are times where prerequisites will shift or change so that they're better aligned with what the program's goals are. And then also um, when we realize there's a student barrier where the prerequisite isn't doing what the faculty thought it would do. And so we make adjustments through the curriculum process. Um, child development has done this quite often. Um, recently, we were looking at math prerequisites. Um, so if you do have both your own curriculum, uh, your own courses as requisites or another departments, um, those are good things to think about. When you have requisites and um, the student meets them um, from coursework at another institution, that is a process that requires manual clearance. Bonnie is very passionate about this and uh, sent a note earlier um, or in the summer a couple weeks ago about prerequisite clearances. But if we do have students who clear prerequisites through other means than our own curriculum, the chair will review that as a discipline expert and can clear that student to enroll in the course. The sooner um, that we address those requests, the easier it is for students to enroll. Um, sometimes uh, there could be, you know, problems with prerequisite clearances, but that also points back to our curriculum as well. Is this working? Is, is this not working? And so then we can reevaluate, reassess, and perhaps there are some tweaks that need to be made. Another curricular process that comes to the chair is a modification of major. So modification of major form is an admissions and records form. It is a request to substitute or waive a course within a degree. So not the general education, but within the degree. Title V requirements are that there are 18 units in a major. Um, our departments have above that most of the time. So if there is... Um, a reason a student or a case a student is, is making for an accommodation to substitute or waive, um, that is up to the discipline uh, faculty and this rests with the chairs um, and you will have an opportunity to review that request. Um, the recommendation is that we make these accommodations and uh, conduct an MOM when it's appropriate and necessary. We want to hold uh, we want to remember that all students, uh, their contract uh, for our degrees is our catalog. And we want to hold students to the same degree requirements as much as possible. So we don't want a student to earn a degree that has 30 units in the major by only completing 24 and all of the other students completing the 30. We want to be you know, equitable and fair as well. Um, the ADTs and the local degrees are slightly different. The modifications within the major of the ADT are um, bound by articulation. 
So when we make substitutions for an ADT, I typically work with the chairs or the counselor um, to review that the uh, course substitution is appropriate. We do not waive courses in the ADT, um, but we can make substitutions so long as it meets the articulation requirements uh, for the degree. And so last but not least, the curriculum website and your division rep. I just want to encourage you to start by reviewing the website. Um, we did a whole refresh um, on the page, grabbed um, the most pertinent information so that you can spend some time here, but also not feel overwhelmed um, by kind of making this your starting point. So you have just a general overview, um, our purpose, um, which we just recently refreshed as well. Uh, we want to be DEI and culturally responsive. Um, but please make sure you, you visit that website. Bonnie, if you can go back, I just want to show really quickly two of the main links you might want to start with. You're going to click on resources and you're going to click on forms and outlines. So I would say those three um, left nav links are going to be your best friends. So your resources are here. The course master list is probably the most frequently visited. That is where you will find the list of courses in your department and their current uh, approval date. Uh, the members, uh, that will show you who you should uh, chat with um, about um, curriculum from your division. The forms are, are also linked on that next um, uh, left nav, just right below that. And when we do submissions for um, proposals, so for programs, courses, um, you will come to that link. Distance set is linked here too, as well as slows and then your outlines. So I get a lot of questions from chairs about where they can find their outlines. They are on our intranet. Um, there is a link there with information on how to get there and as well as a step-by-step -step guide. So uh, I just wanted to share that with you. And again, please use your resources and feel free to ask questions uh, via email or, or anything else. I do have requests. We do get requests for presentations at department meetings. So like this week, I did get a couple of requests or at least one. And so if you would like that for your department, that's something we can do as well. So thank you. And I will um, pass it on to Felicia. Okay, well, thank you, Dee. And uh, thanks, Bonnie, for giving me a little time here to say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Felicia Kalker. For those who don't know me, I'm your friendly uh, SLO coordinator here. Um, most of you know, um, I'll just echo D a little bit here. Uh, most of you know that we've done a lot in the last couple of years in terms of student learning outcomes. So um, interestingly, student learning outcomes are now sort of woven into a lot of other processes. And hopefully that makes it easy um, on department chairs, easier. Um, all, first of all, I just want to say that um, your student learning outcomes are part of your, pro your planning process as a department. So setting what those outcomes are, revising them, making sure they're being assessed and kind of staying current with a regular schedule of assessment is mostly what it's about um, in terms of being the department chair. Uh, as it says here, coordinating. Uh, recently, the departments have all done a lot of work on creating a new assessment schedule. Over the next um, maybe three to six years, you probably have set dates for when each course and each um, outcome is to be assessed. And that includes um, any program learning outcomes as well. Um, so as part of your annual planning process, you have an opportunity to review um, what's going on with that schedule, what needs to come up over the next year, and what SLO changes might be needed, um, and report on that in the annual unit planning. Um, any changes that do need to be made uh, can go through the curriculum forms, as you just mentioned, which is the annual process. So um, at this point in time, um, if you're a new chair, you may not have to come up with a whole schedule, just simply refer back to the one that was created or make sure that the courses are running and being assessed. If a course is no, not offered or if you're not able to assess it when it was scheduled, of course you can make modifications at any time. Just put in a new semester to be assessed. 
Um, and as you know, we also have our Nuventive software, which is um, currently uh, <laughs> in the midst of our latest phase of upgrade for the newer, easier SLO screens. So I recommend, as Bonnie said, I recommend coming to the SLO Liaisons Meetup, which we have once per semester. And then you can always get the latest on what's happening with Inventive, with the software, and any other sort of workshops or related trainings that are going on, um, and ask questions and just be part of our community so that we're all kind of on the same page and know what's happening. Um, and again, we have a website, which is linked here for you. If you want to, you can click on it, Bonnie. <laughs> and um, everything is here. So um, on the left, if you actually, if you click on SLO liaisons, now this can be you, the department chair, or this can be someone that you delegate to be the liaison. Uh, that's fine um, either way, but it goes over here, sort of the role and responsibility as we've been saying, keep current with the schedule, reflect on them as part of your annual process, and make sure the results are entered into Inventive. Um, but there's a whole bunch of resources, and we also have a training course in Canvas. So you can go in and kind of do a self-paced um, training, or please um, feel free to just reach out to me directly. And I'm happy to meet with anyone, either the chair or the whole department, uh, whoever you feel is it's needed uh, to meet with and get you caught up. Okay, so thanks again. All right, thank you so much, Felicia and Dee. And part of the reason I smooshed them both onto one little slide is not because their processes are important. It's because both of those areas have put so much work into building out their resources um, that it is super duper easy for, for you to find all the things that you need. However, they're complicated. And if you can't figure something out, then you know, don't waste time mulling over it, being frustrated. Just reach out to Dee or to Felicia because they can tell it to you off the top of their head and they're super duper, duper nice, helpful people. Um, and so that is my um, two cents about getting all of your um, curriculum and SLO work done. Uh, on time. And I'm going to turn it back to the slideshow. How do I do that? I'm losing my ability to concentrate here. And our next topic is department planning. And I see that Joan is ready to go. I am. Um, hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, I am going to be talking about planning and uh, I'm going to do just a little bit of uh, background for those of you who are new chairs. It looks like we have a lot of um, veteran chairs here, which is great. And um, for those of you who are new to being a chair, welcome. And um, my office is here to assist you in, in this role. We, we pride ourselves in the CPI office of trying to figure out um, ways to make your jobs easier as it, in regards to um, planning. And so um, just to give a very quick overview, uh, so every department and unit um, undergoes a comprehensive uh, program review every six years. And we like to look at the annual unit planning process as an update to the program review. And the annual unit uh, planning process, as the name uh, implies, is done annually. And um, I want to really stress this next point, and that is, is that annual unit planning is not intended to be done in a silo by the department chair alone. It should be a collaborative process that you do with your department or unit colleagues. And, um, you know, it involves um, discussion on um, how well you're meeting your department goals. And so um, I am going to share my screen and just share. Oops, I don't have sharing privileges. Let me, let me give them to you. Okay. I will bestow them. Thank you. Don't worry. You're up. Okay, thank you so much. 
So um, what I hope you see is the fall 2022 annual unit plan timeline here before you. And we actually began work on the fall 2022 um, annual unit plan. Let me interrupt you for one sec, Joan, because people in this room aren't seeing that. Uh, do I have to yeah, yeah, drag this? Yeah, pull back up to the uh, zoom. We'll go down to the bottom and put it in the camera. Is it me or you? Uh, it's. I'm just trying to figure out how to get what you're showing on your screen um, okay. onto the screen in the room. Yeah, you have to back up your screen. I'm not sure how to do that. You can't. <laughs> so minimize that window. Let me, um, Let me, I think I have to, do I have to drag it onto the other screen? Mm -hmm. Oh, you do have it up. I don't know. Okay. Oh, maybe you can mm -hmm. minimize that one. Oh, 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 oh. You need to drag it to the other screen. Yeah, just drag that over. I'm, oh, I'm dragging. View. It's got to be a um, uh, uh not full screen. There you go. And drag it over. There you go. Oh my gosh, that was so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. So you can see it now. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we actually began work um, or, or began the new cycle with some preliminary steps. Uh, we, um, so, so, I, so let me again, just reiterate that the annual unit plan is an update to um, the program review uh, six year uh, uh, plan. And the annual unit planning for those of you who are new is the time when we reflect on how well, um, we have done to meet our department goals, and then to also um, uh, determine whether or not we have resource requests that need to be submitted. And the types of resource requests that are submitted um, are staffing requests, faculty positions, and classified professional positions, technology requests, facilities, project requests, research requests from the CPI office, and professional development requests. And these forms are all available in um, the Nuventive. Um, Felicia was just talking about our outcomes assessment uh, in Nuventive. Nuventive also has um, uh, our program review templates and our annual unit plan templates so that all of what we call integrated planning, which is this kind of um, institution-wide planning, everything you need is inside Nuventive. And so um, going to the timeline, we started the process by asking um, deans to work with their departments chairs and give us uh, in CPI a preliminary notice of whether or not you're going to be applying for positions. This is particularly important for uh, faculty positions because we need to have time in the CPI office to pull the data that you need to use, um, analyze, and use in your um, staffing requests for faculty positions in particular. And so the deans uh, notified us um, by June of um, the spring semester, you know, uh, gave us a preliminary, preliminary notice. We'll be sending out those, that data um, probably this week or early next week to the deans who will then distribute it to their department chairs. And um, also in, on June 1st, we asked that if you had a facilities project request that you submit um, that the first part of the request, which is a feasibility request to Lauren Holmquist, our Director of Facilities and Operations, so that he can do that uh, feasibility request over the summer. And um, he will be returning those to the deans uh, between the 1st of September and the 10th of September. And uh, he will indicate whether, we, in terms of feasibility, whether it's doable and whether it's affordable. And um, so that's ongoing right now. And then um, some other information, we're asking that uh, your uh, SLO liaisons 
report the um, SLO results and how they're going to be used um, to improve in Nuventa by September 9th. And the reason why we're suggesting that is because on the annual unit plan um, form, which is due on October 3rd, you have to do some analysis of those results. So it's important to get the results in first and then can do that analysis. Then um, we're suggesting that deans set up a deadline for department chairs to um, get their annual unit plans turned into the deans because they do need to review them before um, the plans and resource requests are submitted into Nuventa. Or I'm sorry, they'll you'll submit them into Nuventa. The deans will read them in Nuventa, and then they turn in um, a checklist to the CPI office letting them know that they have indeed um, reviewed all the annual unit plans for, the, for their area. So to give the deans time to um, read them, they need to be, um, the, the deans need to let you know how soon to get them in. Um, the annual unit plans are due on Monday, October 3rd by five o'clock. And then um, the CPI office will pull all of the annual unit plans and resource requests and send them off to the prioritization committee committees. And they will then um, uh, deliberate and prioritize those requests. So um, it's a uh, sort of a lengthy uh, process. If you're new to this process, um, I am more than willing to sit down and, and provide some uh, guidance with you. Your deans are also now very much involved in the process. They can answer questions. Again, I really encourage you to do this um, together with your colleagues and not as a um, solo uh, uh, process. So um, that's sort of a quick overall. Um, <laughs> and by the way, I should say that um, program review and annual unit planning are um, ways for which the college as a whole can um, determine how well it's meeting its mission and its strategic goals. And so um, this is very important work. It's work that's tied to accreditation and work that's tied to uh, continuous improvement and to doing the best we can to serve our students. So, Thank you, Joan. You're welcome. Um, again, so the take home message is um, <laughs> there's a, there's deadlines that you as the chair need to be aware of so that you can make sure the process is moving along in your department and also that you as the chair are not responsible for doing all of this work. You're more coordinating, managing the deadlines and that other folks in your department should be contributing. If they refuse <laughs> to participate, I'll come and have a chat with your department because it's 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 all of our jobs. It is it is all of this is is part of our jobs. Um, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about um, some of the areas around campus you might not be familiar with. What other folks do. So that was the funnest thing that I found about participating in the program review committee was getting to read the program reviews of departments all around campus. And there were departments I didn't even know we had. I was like, what? We have a, what? wait, what is this? What do you people do over there? I don't even know what this is. Um, and then also finding out about um, all the different kinds of works work that different departments need to do. So I got a list from Christy Vecino, the um, coordinator of um, Occupational Therapy Assistant. <laughs> And I think one of the things that's, that's impressive about all of the allied health um, areas is that um, they have a bunch of extra work to do compared to the other departments. They, students have to apply for their programs. They have a very set curriculum. Everybody moves through it at the same time. It's a little bit more like a four-year university. Like, you know, you started and you were in your freshman major classes with the same students and you went, <laughs> went through with all the same people. Um, and so they have, um, you know, a really strict uh, set of SLOs in all of those courses. They all map from one to the next. They have um, programmatic 
um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, accreditation that they have to report on in addition to doing their program review and their annual <laughs> plans. Um, they have different sources of funding. They have to submit data that are going to support the, um, the pay that they get from, um, from the state because they're considered a, a, like they're considered career technical um, um, areas. So I think it's really nice to learn about the work that our colleagues do in other departments and in other divisions because when we respect and admire the work that our colleagues do in other areas on campus, uh, we can see how they all contribute to student success. They meet the needs of our different student populations and what rock stars our fellow faculty are from these different areas around campus. I'm gonna move through these a little bit quickly, partly because we don't have all of these folks here. Um, um, oh. Javier, were you going to jump on and do, let me put this back on my other screen. Hi, oh, hold on, give me a second. I know that Robin's online for the CT. Oh, I mean, Robin like, is here, right? I'm yeah. sorry, my brain yeah. is um, turning into mosh. Go ahead, Robin. Thank you for I'm being here. here today. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh, and listening to uh, what everybody said previously, um, one of the things I just wanted to uh, point out that communication is key. Uh, I was mentioned several times. I wrote down, you know, Sean talking about collaboration and Javier mentioning the shift and pivot. It's one of those things that <clears throat> I really appreciate in the work we do within our division with, with our dean. Um, he's always a phone call or a text away. <clears throat> and if you can't talk at that moment, he say, hey, give me a minute and he'll call back. You know, we've had conversations on Sundays. Um, I can hear kids in the background and I'm sure he can hear my kids in the background as well. Um, Yesterday we spoke, I was on the freeway on the way back from somewhere and it's just a, having this great communication able to uh, again shift and pivot. <clears throat> and we did have that, um, we did encounter a, a uh, instructor who last week I believe said he would not be able to teach three classes. So he's just out for the semester, personal reasons. And we had to really just kind of uh, a lot of communication back and forth trying to figure out what's the best um, Way to go about this, and and um, with the help of my dean, he was able to. We were able to figure it out. Um, our division is a little bit different in that, uh, as a CTE program, we are required to have advisory uh, committees, and that involves having great relationships with those people on the community that are potential employers for our students. Um, we we have advisory committees once a year. Uh, sometimes twice a year. During the pandemic, it has been a little bit rough, but we have had a lot of input from a lot of local uh, employers and what they're looking for from our students. <clears throat> in addition to that, they let us know what are some of the trends that they're seeing in their classroom. So then we can then shift our curriculum if need be or shift uh, when we're offering certain classes. Uh, we do work uh, hand in hand with Head Start, which is one of the biggest employers of child development students. Um, and they really have a lot of, um, we're lucky enough to have them, uh, to work with them on a daily basis. Our center now has a collaboration with Head Start. Uh, so we have them right next to us at all times. And as things change in the industry, we are aware of those. And again, I'm going to go back to shift and pivot. We have to shift and pivot. Um, in addition to other, uh, differences uh, between us and other divisions is that we do use uh, Perkins funding that allows us to provide different types of monies for different, um, for example, in our department, we use it to help employ some of our student workers at our center. Uh, so we, they get hands-on um, experience with uh, the staff down at the center. Uh, we also use uh, funding for things like materials to provide uh, work-based learning assignments. Uh, so the materials that go on on a daily basis, you know, we use some of those fundings for that. Um, I wrote a bunch of notes here, and I'm thinking, I'm not sure if we have time for all this. Before I move on, Javier, is there anything else about Perkins? No, I think a big part of it is that it's a federal mandated grant that impacts this, impact career technical education. So occasionally we'll use it to fund buying simulation lab uh, units for nursing 
or equipment for cardiovascular tech, but it's highly regulated. But so the faculty have to know the ins and outs on what's eligible, what's not eligible, how to make a proposal, how to respond to an audit. Um, so it's you know it's kind of another layer of specialty for the uh, career technical education and allied health and nursing programs. There's another layer of regulations, specialty accreditation, you name it, that really goes into their programs and the connection with employers is super critical. And there's also annual, you know, we, we talk about program review, but the, the folks in the CT at Allied Health and Nursing also have to do biannual reports that go to the uh, board on an uh, annual basis to show the whether the programs are meeting labor market information, you know, there's no duplicity, all those kinds of things. So, um, so along with um, the other core of activities that have been shared so far, there's this added um, factor as well. You know, I was kind of laughing when <clears throat> Bonnie was talking about, you know, fighting uh, with other other departments for, for, you know, different things. And I think with our division, especially when it comes to Perkins funding, we've sat at some of those meetings and some people, some departments will say, hey, you know what, this semester we can hold off on that. X department, you can have our funding, you can use it for, for your uh, need this semester. So, um, and then there's always a question about what is eligible, what is an eligible expense for Perkins? And we always rely on, on, on our Dean and, and Janice to kind of help us through that process. Um, one of the other things too that <clears throat> within our, our division, especially our department, we do have specialized agencies that we work with. Uh, we work closely with the County Office of Education um, here in San Diego, obviously, um, on different projects. Um, they ask for our input and how they run some of the early uh, child development programs. Um, currently, we are, um, last semester, last year, we worked with them on a grant that allowed us to pay tuition for students, uh, provide additional advice, uh, advising uh, hours, uh, free computer, uh, help them with their child development permits. Uh, so a bunch of different things. And that was because we had that close relationship with uh, San Diego County Office of Education. Um, and that really does provide support. That grant provides support for the local workforce. So the participants in that grant are part of the workforce force already, and we're bringing them back to school and giving them that additional training that they need to move up um, at work. We work closely with community care licensing. So there are other agencies that we have to not just meet the requirements for, for courses that we teach, but also community care licensing are some of the requirements that we have to meet for our child development lab school to run. So they kind of are our um, regulatory body that kind of tells us what we need to do as far as health and safety for, um, for the children at the center. We work closely with the California Commission on Teaching Credentialing for permits. So <clears throat> one of the things that students have to know and we have to provide for them is that you can get that degree, you can get that certificate, but on top of that, you also have to have a child development permit, which comes from the state of California. So we have to make sure that our faculty are aware um, of that process so that they can teach every student that comes through our program about these requirements. Um, we also are requiring students to register for the uh, California Early Care and Education Workforce Registry. And that really kind of keeps track of the students um, and what kind of training they've been doing once they become employed. And we, we were able to better track the students to see how successful they have become having gone through our training. I, I just got word right before our meeting that we just had our, a student from last um, spring who graduated. She's now in Houston and she landed this big position as an outdoor education curriculum uh, designer, developer. And that's a big deal. Uh, and, I, and I think we as a department kind of are proud of that because we really work close with the student and to be able to track her and see her successes is just one of, one of those wonderful things that we get to do in the department. Um, I have a couple of other- Robin, I'm gonna interrupt you because I'm okay. worried about getting to all of That's... the other presenters that we have today. You've said so much already that I am sufficiently impressed with all of the extra stuff you have to do <laughs> in your area. <laughs> Um, and again, I have to apologize. Um, I'm getting really tired and um, I'm struggling to work um, my controls here. So I accidentally did not notice that Christy was here in the meeting and um, should have given her the opportunity pr to present. So I want to go back to 
the um, allied health slide and just let Christy say hello and say anything else that she wanted to say about her fabulous program. So she feels valued today. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. You're so funny, Bonnie. I just switched to my cell phone because I didn't know if I'd be able to stay the whole time. <laughs> I just really wanted to say that I find being the program director for OTA very rewarding because there's so much support from everybody on campus ever since I started. And um, just chairs and coordinators council, the Uber chair meetings, the dean support between the curriculum and the SLO team, it's amazing. It is better now than it's ever been. The new chairs coming in and those thinking about it, they are very lucky. Um, the bookstore people, Andrea, planning textbooks is huge. Um, Perkins, Javier's generosity and collaborative way of divvying up money and talking about who needs what and everybody being so helpful and saying, yes, I could give you some. It's so lovely. <laughs> That was pretty much all I wanted to say. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christy. It's nice to hear your voice. Bye. Hey, can I, can I quickly just uh, say something, Bonnie, just to, by the way, it's not my generosity. I just want to say it's a federal government. It's a federal grant. <laughs> but I, I just want to make that very clear. It's all uh, of our tax dollars. Yeah, yeah. And, we, and we, we have a very clear process where everybody can set their priorities and share those priorities. And then we use that for planning. I just want to make that very clear. That's not some some slush fund or anything like that. It's really it's federal money. We are we're ultimately accountable uh, for it. Um, so we have to make sure we spend it the best way possible that's allowable uh, within the grant guidelines. That's my administrative sharing out here. All right. It was your generous generous personality I was referring. <laughs> to. All right, we have um, we have two more presenters in the room that I absolutely want to make sure we have time for, and so we're going to hear from Nadra Farina House from the library, and then um, our very most specialist guest, um, Marianne Landry from the dean's office, will be our last um, visitor. Thanks, Lonnie. I really appreciate that. I can't tell you how excited I was when I got your email that you know you're thinking of the. Um, department chairs who are not typical classroom faculty, which the librarians and counselors are. We are those non-classroom faculty. And uh, Bonnie, I think Julie had left a slide or something as part of this. So I'm not the current department chair, Julie Middlemas is, but when uh, Bonnie reached out, I was just so excited to be a part of this and included that I'm like, oh, I'll fill in. So. We talk a lot about communication within um, being a department chair, and we really have broken down our areas of work into three different categories. Um, and I would say they would be librarian communication, administrative communication, and reporting, which is a form of communication. So on the bullet on the um, slide that Julie presented, I don't know if it's up there yet or not, but the librarian communication includes those those first few four bullet points that you see there on the slide, but it also includes things like coordinating our online reference chat service. We do reference both in person and online with the same amount of librarians. And it also includes things like coordinating um, or handling the schedule changes, such as how to get the reference desk co uh, covered when somebody calls in sick. It's very important to us that there is a faculty person, a librarian at the reference desk every hour the library is open. That, that is our, our classroom. And the department chair also hires and trains our new adjunct librarians. Uh, they do that in collaboration with the rest of the group. Um, we're a small group and, and mighty and we work together very well. Under what I call administrative communication, I would say that we do, <laughs> this is funny, we do some of the classroom faculty, like we know what line sheets are um, because we do offer one class. <laughs> so we have one class, one section every semester. And so we go through those edits along with the catalog edits and the attending the Senate and chairs and coordinators meetings. Um, and it is, in addition to that, the department chair will meet monthly with our dean as well as in the division leadership meetings. 
And those are meetings you know, that has the, the faculty person, the librarian, and then all the other people that, might, that are in the division of the LTR, such as um, distance education, for example. That's a good one to think of. Um, and then it is so important that this department chair not only attends those meetings, but that they report that back to the librarians, whether in our biweekly meetings or in a written format. We just always have that flow of communication going. And then lastly, I talk about record, um, reporting. Of course, there's the, an, the annual surveys that we have to do. Um, we're required to report our statistics, which includes items such as, oh, the average age of our collection, how many books we circulate per year, uh, our interlibrary loan requests and fills, how many workshops were taught, how many students were addressed, um, how many students we uh, worked with in person at the reference desk or online um, getting reference data. And that's just, that's just to name a few items and we are required to report that to the state. Um, it, it just seems that if anything happens that's new or um, coming up in the library, whether it be a disciplinary um, problem, uh, maybe it's something with a person coming into the building, not using our facilities the way they were intended, this kind of goes always to the department chair and then we, we um, deal with that as a, as a group with our dean. And I'm going to get you back on track, Bonnie. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing with us. Um, one of my first leadership roles on campus, well, sort of, um, I participated in a, in a college-wide um, uh, level was working on the accreditation standard with Carrie Kilber mm. that was about library. And I was uh, just astonished at all of the neat things that you all are doing over there and the contribution you make to our our student learning at the college. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to quickly mention that um, um, Gary Johnson couldn't be here today and that we, we as full-time faculty sometimes forget that librarians and counselors are also faculty and that there's a department chair over there in counseling and that the kind of work they do, again, like libraries, a little bit different. Um, scheduling all the counselors is a, is a big part of their job and um, you know making sure that there's um, enough appointments and different kinds of appointments that students um, are being served and um, interacting with the rest of the college to make sure we know about all the things that counseling is doing. So I want to skip ahead to um, probably one of the most important areas on our campus, the deanery. And um, Cindy Hall couldn't be here today. And Marianne Landry is gonna tell us a little bit about from her perspective um, of what is important, what chairs do and what is important for them to know. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Hello. Um, every, a lot of people have already mentioned this topic before and the, only, the main thing I thought of when she asked me was communication. Communication, communication, just always keep the administrative assistance in the loop. And on that slide, I put down some of the minutia details of what we do that the reason that communication is so important, um, you know, and higher letter production, slight, small schedule changes, we needed to revise a higher letter that affects people's pay. It's important that we be in the loop on that. Um, and other schedule changes, you know, classes canceled, reassigned, converted to web or second eight weeks. We just need to be in the loop on all of that. Um, and then hiring new part-time instructors. We've talked about that a little bit already, but quite often I find myself in the role of, you know, connecting with Blanca and say, hey, is this person started their onboarding yet? We need to kind of hurry them along. Do you need me to email them? So keep us in a loop that you have somebody in the queue waiting to be hired so that we can help you with that. Um, evaluations. Um, oh, also on part-time instructors, we also try and give orientation to our new part-time instructors. So we need to be aware of who's, you know, who is being onboarded. 
um, evaluations. We help compile the list of people who are being evaluated each semester. So we reach out to the department chairs for a little bit of help with that. We, um, we reach out to department chairs for peer evaluators who's going to be a peer. So we need uh, effective communication and you know quick responses on the email for those and um, meetings, setting up meetings for plans of improvement or for tenure, tenure review committee meetings at the beginning of the semester, one big tenure review committee meeting for all the members of each committee within the division. And at the end, we set up the individual tenure. So again, it's more of the communication the quick email responses so we can um, schedule all the meetings on the dean's calendar. Um, if you have an extended instructor absence or you learn that instructor's absence, the communication with us is important because we need to do the paperwork to payroll so that they're paid out of their sick leave or their bereavement leave or their personal necessity leave, whatever. And if there's a sub, if the sub gets paid. So we just appreciate being copied on or informed of that. This is something, this next one is something that came because of COVID. All of a sudden, line sheets went from being paper and red pencils to PDF. And frankly, several of my chairs didn't know how to use PDF. So I zoomed with them and said, let me give you, a, you know, it's not hard, but there's just one little trick here and there. If you don't know it, it's hard. But if you know that trick, it works and it's easy. And so it was, how, you know, how can I help you? you know, make this process, it's so much easier than sending a snapshot of every single page in the line sheets to the administrative assistant who, that does not work. <laughs> so, you know, I, we're always glad to help the chairs, you know, smooth out the process and find out the ways they can get this done more smoothly. Already, um, division council has been mentioned. We meet in our division, um, first Friday of every month from 12 to 2. And so, you know, with your input on what goes on the agenda, um, it's just a wonderful place to share and to, um, it was so good to have our first face-to-face -face division council meeting after COVID. We were just, I mean, we just, we talked, I think most of the meeting, not even doing the agenda. It was just so good to be together again. It's so important. Um, and we help with the student complaint process. So again, keep us copied. When you, when you have an instructor who has a student complaint, keep us copied, please, so that we can help facilitate and we help the stu facilitate the student through the process. So we can advise them, okay, you know, this is the first step, but keep me copied on your email to the chair. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll stay with you via email. I'll help you through the process, but keeping, us copied when you send emails to it, it's just very important. Um, and Cindy also mentioned that Nance hire forms, some departments collect all the TA hours that are earned and they, um, people donate their hours say to the department or to other people. And so that again, it's important for us to be copied on those kind of emails so we know what's going on. So. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and I would just say from, um, for my division, Cindy Hall, she's the person that literally I email her if I have absolutely no idea what to do or how to do something. <laughs> and she will find out and she'll get back to me. And she is so patient with um, helping everybody, not just chairs, but all faculty making sure their hire letters are correct, um, making sure that they have all the things they need, whatever forms they need. Um, and that is incredibly important to um, keeping, getting everybody paid <laughs> and, um, and keeping everything running smoothly. Um, we're getting close to wrapping up. So I wanna turn it and give the last word. Um, to the deans, I know that Javier put some thoughts on this slide. So we'll start with him and then um, just uh, give Sean and Augustine one more minute to wrap up with any concluding thoughts they have. So go ahead, Javier. Yeah, and, and we can just chime in. I think we're probably gonna say the same thing. 
um, because we do very we do work very closely together. Not that we share a brain, we're very different, but we do uh, a lot of similar things. I think, you know, here in the presentation today, uh, my big takeaway, and it's on the slide, um, it's really, you. the more time you spend on the communication, the personal touch, getting to know each other, the uh, it's, it's a lot of work in the beginning. We know a chair, coordinator, and the dean, but it pays off in the long term. I can't overstate that. More time now in building the relationship and communication. I know that everybody's um, really, you know, kind of uh, some of us are introverted, some are extroverted. So, but from from the perspective of what is effective, is more time now relationship building, bigger yields and rewards later on. That's like said. That's like the big part. Um, and you see that because it helps in uh, problem solving anticipating issues it helps in um, planning you know because when you have that kind of that rapport with each other you're going to be uh, pretty unstoppable in getting the work done so and you know I'm one of the few deans that was hired externally in the whole district and I'm starting my eighth year so eighth year as a dean of CT external hire so some people say how dare you hire somebody from outside uh, California mm -hmm. but here here we are almost eight years later Okay, so that 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 whole piece really cats, uh, is an umbrella for the other items. When you are, uh, you know, making that personal connection with each other, building the rapport, investing time, however you want to do it in your own styles, it, you know, it allows you to focus on your budgets, productivity. You can see those uh, go through those issues a lot easier. Planning um, can, you know, um, you're able to communicate about issues that come up, not be reactive, but build them into planning. And you're looking to see how the work fits into the future and the vision um, and the mission. So I think a big part, um, and it kind of ties in with our presentation today from our guest speaker is, is we have to be, you know, in our roles, all of, you know, chair, uh, chair coordinator, dean, their leadership roles. And part of leadership is really um, taking a position that not everybody's like you. First step, not everybody's like you. And that means that, that, you know, you get to figure out what everybody else is like. So, and then see where the opportunities are to, to work together. And that leads to my final point, you know, uh, Lev Vygotsky, Russian child development, family study person, lots of amazing research, but the whole point of, on the zone of proximal development is by figuring out how you are and how other folks are, you can find that zone of proximal development that you can work on together. And then you can kind of build a mission, you know, work on the uh, mission, build a vision for your programs, departments, and address all those issues on that slide. So I'll leave it at that, and I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague, Deans, Augustine, and Sean. Thank you, Dr. Ayala. Uh, absolutely. Going on with the, the ZPD from Vygotsky, one of my uh, personal uh, uh, theorists that I'm highly interested in have been for many years is the theory of the more capable peer. And so in, in the ZPD, the theory of the more capable peer or the theory of the more capable other many times is someone like Javier or someone like Sean, that uh, maybe there's some kind of gap of information that I don't have that I'll go walk right next door and bounce something off of one of my peers. And it might be something that he's worked with a hundred times or might not be familiar with, but we share and we communicate and discuss. I also want to accentuate the personal touch. Uh, COVID put a little bit of a damper on things, but wearing out the shoe leather, right? Walking out of this Dean office to go over to where the chairs are and making personal visits on a regular basis, sometimes on a daily basis. Uh, in addition to right, you know, texting and phone call like, um, Robin shared that, you know, they spoke yesterday. Uh, I too was speaking with a couple of chairs uh, yesterday as well with some needs that we have for this week. And that investiture that uh, Javier was talking about, so, so key, you know, to go off and break bread and just get to know one another and, and talk uh, and what, what makes people tick, what works, what doesn't work in terms of communication style and knowledge and those kinds of things. I certainly don't know it all and I rely on the department chairs. I am learning from them every day and uh, it's important that they have uh, input, they have a voice, that they are valued, and they are heard. Let me pitch it over to Sean if he's still in the room. 
one minute. I'm still here, and uh, I just wanted to close out with uh, one of the tenants from the four agreements. And in that book, they talked about doing the best job that you can. Don't think about what other people are doing in the job. Like I thought about what the deans before me did, and I thought, I can't do that. I can't be them. And that's right. I can't be them. But I can bring what I have to the table. I can do the best job that I can. And I can't uh, try to do spend a whole lot of energy and time trying to get a little bit better than myself when I can reach out to others and ask for help. So I carry this ball as far as I can. I look for people that can help and I, I ask for that help. And like we've heard, there's a lot of support on this campus to move things forward. Yeah, so I just wanna close by saying that I really appreciate all of my colleagues who came and gave parts of the presentation today. Um, it takes a village <laughs> and everybody has um, knowledge and information to share and that we all, like, like the deans were just saying, we can learn from somebody else's perspective, whether they're a student, whether they're an administrator, a classified staff, or our fellow faculty, and that being a chair is not as scary as I thought it would be um, because there's so much support and help. And I, I sometimes have a hard time asking for help when I need it, but it has always been there if when I have asked. And so I really appreciate um, those of you who took time out of your day to visit our workshop, and I hope it was useful and valuable to you. Um, I want to carry on this conversation with anybody who's, who's interested. Um, you know, uh, send me an email, we'll have a coffee and, <laughs> and chat some more. And um, I think I had one other thing to say that has completely flown out of my head. So I will say thank you everyone and chairs and coordinators, I will see you over at the AFT meeting in a few minutes. <laughs> thank you, Bonnie. Thank you everyone, have a great day. You're welcome. Nice to see you. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to get kind of an overview, sort of see what you're up against. And yeah. Um, yeah, I am I am busy being chair and chair of chairs this semester. So um, I have lots I have lots of, of availability actually. So how do I get into this for the chairs and chairs and coordinators? Um, I will... Yeah, I'll email you. Yeah, I, hopefully I'll remember. Um, but if you send me an email, then yeah. I will make sure I do it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Natalie. Nice to see you.